up guys? Welcome to part six of my Revit 2 3ds Max workflow. This one's all about post-production. It's sort of the last one in this little mini series. I set out to show that 3ds Max isn't as complicated and overwhelming as most people think that it is. Each one of the previous videos covers the basic tools needed for each step of my viz process. If you learn nothing else about 3ds Max, just the tools that we learned paired with a little bit of creativity will allow you to make tons of great images. Each one of these videos could dovetail into all sorts of tips, tricks, and tidbits. There are plugins for more intricate modeling, managing your scene, you could do animation, virtual reality, etc. My hope is that I've laid out a solid foundation so that you can explore Max on your own terms and be much more comfortable deciding what direction you ultimately want to go to suit your own needs. I also want to reiterate that this has just been a technical overview of the tools, which is only 50% of a good image. Make sure to spend an equal amount of time on the artistic stuff, composition, color theory, hierarchy, as no amount of rendering tricks or settings are going to help improve your image if you aren't treating it like the art form that it is. If you've liked anything that I've shared so far, I would totally appreciate a thumbs up, a comment, even a subscribe. If there is anything you want me to do a deeper dive on, please let me know as well as I'm all ears. So let's get into some post-production. I generally like to keep my post-production fairly simple, mostly just some color corrections here and there, but I'm going to give you a solid framework that you can work within to use render passes in Photoshop in a non-destructive workflow to go as light or heavy as you really want to go. It's going to be completely up to you. Let's get into it. Let's first do a quick primer on render elements and how you set those up because they're pretty useful and you can do a whole lot with them. Go up into your render settings dialog box and jump over to your render element tab. You should already have a handful of these turned on because we set them up back when we did our template in part one. Um, if not, all you do is you click add and you get this whole list of different elements that you can turn on. You can turn on all of them or none of them. They don't actually affect the final image. They just provide you with isolated elements of your scene, which will be more clear in just a minute. For demonstration purposes, I've turned on all of these C essential ones, but I don't actually use them too frequently. The two that I use a ton are the Z depth and the wire color. And then the last one is the interactive light mix, which is a little bit of annoying how, it, how it's set up. But when you click this light bulb icon, it creates the interactive light mix pass and then one layer for every different light type that you have. I pretty much just completely disregard all of those. So let's go back to our image. You do have to have turned those on before you hit render. Um, you unfortunately can't turn them on afterwards. But if you have done that, now just go to this drop down menu and you'll be able to cycle through all of these different render elements that you just turned on. You have your alpha pass, you have just the direct light, you have the indirect light, you can see just the reflections, the refractions through glass. And then you get to my favorites like the Z-depth, which represents distance in an image by making objects far away darker and close objects whiter. It makes it much easier to do some depth of field tricks in Photoshop. And then you have the wire color pass, which is literally my favorite. It makes every material a different color, so in Photoshop, you can super quickly select individual objects and apply local adjustments without having to manually mask things or use the lasso tool. And then the last one that I use a ton is the interactive light mix. And like we talked about in the previous video, this is the pass that individually lets you control each light without having to re-render the entire image. If we jump back to the beauty tab, you can see what the default light settings were versus how we adjust them in the interactive light mix. And then if you wanna click through the remaining ones, you'll find that these are all each individual light isolated on a separate layer, which I really don't use, but there's probably some way that you could creatively combine them in Photoshop, but that's up to you. So when one of my renders finishes, I save it out by selecting the Save CXR button, find somewhere on your hard drive, and save that guy out. It's going to be a container for all of our render passes in a single file. So double clicking that file outside of 3ds Max is going to open up this Corona image editor. It's a standalone application that's going to mimic the frame buffer that you have in 3ds Max and give you all the same tools that you have inside of Max, outside of Max. You have your post tab with all of your exposure settings, and then you still have your light mix with all of your individual settings there. And lastly, you have the drop down with all of your render passes that you can still cycle through. I encourage you to play around with your settings here because there are a lot of really powerful tools and you can get 90% of the way to having a finished image just by playing with the tools available to you in this editor. I know a lot of firms that try not to do any Photoshop work because if you can just say that you have a finished image now, 
you've saved a ton of extra time. That said, there are a few things in Photoshop that I still like to do, so I will save out all the render passes that I need and pull them into Photoshop. To do that, you just hit the Save All button, and it's gonna save out every pass as a different file. I like to save them as TIFF files. There's some people on the internet that would probably argue you should do an EXR file and keep everything at 32-bit, but to me, it's just a little bit of a headache. When you hit Save, it'll bring up this dialog box. Be aware of this Include Alpha Channel box. Keeping it on will remove all the background from your image. I like the HDRI sky, it's less work for me, so I always uncheck that so I get that to come in. But that's up to you, you should experiment both ways. And then it will also prompt you for 8, 16, or 32-bit. I like 16, it just makes my life easier. And then you can hit OK and watch it export all 30 of your different render passes. So now let's jump into Photoshop. To bring these in, you're not going to select Open. You're going to go down to Scripts and select Load Files from Stack. Here's where you're going to browse to where all of your render passes are, and you're going to select all of them all at once. You'll get them all listed out, and then you hit OK, and you'll get a little bit of Photoshop magic where each pass will be brought in as its own layer into a single document. So again, it's worth noting that this is a lot of render passes, and I really don't use almost any of them. The real power in this whole workflow is that all of these options are available to you and you can start tweaking things to this extent if you want to, but I really don't. So at this point, I'm just gonna delete a whole bunch of these extra ones because they're not really part of my workflow. I will leave a few of these essential ones because I can show you what you might wanna do with them, but at least this is a bit more pared down. So let's make a handful of folders and I'll show you how I organize my scene. I like to have an effects folder, a color correction folder, an adjustment folder, a base folder, and a paint folder. I think that's it. And I want my paint folder a little bit higher up. There you go, that's the basic way that I organize. Okay, wait, nope. Uh, no, I also have a mask folder. There you go. So I, the mask folder is where I put my masks, like my alpha, my wire color, and my z-depth pass. I put the beauty pass and the interactive light mix in the base folder. And then all of those render passes, the reflection, the refraction passes, I'm going to put those in another folder called passes, and I'll stack that in the base layer. So this is now the folder structure for all of my scenes. You can see that if I turn the interactive light mix on and off, you, we have that difference between the original beauty pass and the interactive light mix. I'm just going to go ahead and delete that original beauty pass because I like how I set the lights up in my light mix and I really don't need both. So here's a little rundown on my folder structure. The base folder just holds the base render passes exported from 3ds Max. The ADJ folder is my local adjustments folder. It's where I will mask out specific parts of the scene and apply local color or brightness adjustments. The paint layer is where I'm going to paint on new things in the scene, like a different background or fog, people, or different trees. The CC layer are color corrections, and those are going to be global color corrections that are going to be applied to everything in the scene rather than just specific masks. This FX layer is going to be for special effects. If there are any sort of global color painting, god ray type things that I'm going to add on top of everything else, it'll go in here. And then this mask layer is more of a, a working folder that I'll often keep hidden and only turn on when I need to use it mostly just for selecting different things for various reasons. So to get started, let's work from the bottom up. Let's hide everything and go down to our base layer. And let's right click that base file and hit convert to smart object. This is part of a non-destructive workflow that is going to let us save any of the color adjustments we make to it so that if I update the rendering in Max, I can pull it back in and reapply all these color adjustments without losing any work. So let's go up to Filter and hit Camera Raw Filter. This opens up what is effectively Adobe Lightroom. 
but within Photoshop. We have all the tools that we need to adjust exposure. We can play around with our white balance. We've got some pretty cool dehazing tools, clarity, pretty much everything that you can find in Lightroom, you can find in this panel. And because we're applying it as a smart object to that layer, all of these settings are gonna be retained and you'll be able to come back in here and tweak things if you need to. Hit okay. And you'll now have this camera raw filter on the bottom of your interactive light mix pass. So let's go ahead and turn on our passes folder. So this is really gonna be up to you and how you wanna build your scene, but you can use your blending modes to achieve different effects with different passes. So if we take a reflection pass and set the blending mode to screen, we'll see that all of the reflections are boosted just a tiny bit. You can change the opacity to control the strength of this, but it's ultimately gonna be up to you to determine when and why you might wanna be using something like this. We can do the same thing with the refraction pass. Let's change the blending mode to that one to screen as well. And you'll see that all of the interior objects are much brighter compared to how they were without the pass turned on. Again, you can use the opacity slider to determine how much you wanna increase or decrease that brightness. So I'm just gonna leave this pass folder off because I don't actually think that playing with those render passes is too necessary for the scene, but let's jump to the adjustment folder and I'll show you how I do some local adjustments. Let's go turn on the mask folder and pull our wire color up to the top. If you use the magic wand tool, you can click something in the scene. And as long as you have contiguous deselected up on the taskbar, you will select all of that color in the image. So now if we go down to our adjustment folder and we hit this little icon, you will bring up a menu that will let you select brightness contrast, hue saturation, levels. Clicking any of these will create a masked adjustment layer specifically for the selection that we chose from our wire color pass then you're able to adjust to your heart's content. Here, I'll show you another quick one. Let's go back to the wire color pass, and this time, let's select all of the yellow trees that we have. Let's turn off our mask layer, and let's apply a hue saturation adjustment. So I noticed when I was using the magic wand tool, it also selected the ground. If you alt click on the mask on the right side, it will bring you into this mask editor view where you can select whatever you don't want to apply the adjustment to and fill it as black, alt click out. And then when you apply that adjustment, it will only be to the white portions of that mask. So this is another one that I strongly encourage you spend a lot of time getting comfortable with because with these simple masking and adjustment layer tools, you can very quickly and very dramatically change the entire look of an image just by individually tweaking a whole bunch of different objects. So let's jump to the paint folder. As I mentioned earlier, this is where I would be adding new things to the scene, painting in 2D objects. For example, if I wanted to add in fog, this is where I would render in the clouds, change the perspective and the lighting, and then start to blend in all the masking so that it actually fit in with the scene. This is another one of those skill sets that I think it's worth it to be aware of, but I don't actually do a lot of the time. My personal preference is to do more work in 3D so that if I decide to change anything down the road, I don't have to come back and figure out how I did all this 2D work. But I know that a ton of people love to put in people and trees, grunge, and all sorts of different backgrounds. This is the folder that I'd be putting that stuff if I was building a scene like that. So then we have the color correction folder. And this is where I would just apply global color corrections on top of everything without having any specific mask. The goal is just to pick up any other additional color corrections I might wanna make after adding in any of those local adjustments or any painted elements. I actually sort of like the muted look that I had previously, so I'm not going to keep any of these color corrections I just added. So that just leaves us with this effects folder. This is where I dump in whatever artistic, creative idea I might have for an image. Often it'll just be adding a little bit of a vignette or a pop of warm color at an interior or an entry spot, just sort of painting some more dynamic light around an image. And there you have it. That's 
pretty much how I set up all of my Photoshop files. If you notice, it's almost entirely non-destructive. I can now go back through all of my folders and tweak anything that I need to. I can even re-render the image with a couple different changes and update it without losing almost any work. I always think it's pretty cool that just a handful of color adjustments can make a pretty big impact on how an image is perceived. So there you have it. That pretty much caps off my entire process of taking a Revit model all the way through to some high-end imagery in a pretty much fully parametric way, which is possible to incorporate into an actual design workflow. Like I said earlier, this is just the foundation and there are all sorts of ways that you can learn more intricate ways to take even more control of your design imagery. Let me know if you want me to do any follow-up videos and go in depth into anything else in Max or Revit for that matter. If you've been following along and trying this stuff yourself, I'd love to see what you've been coming up with. Feel free to reach out and show me what you've been up to. Otherwise, good luck, make sure to have fun, and go make some dope shit. Also, I clearly lost the beard that I was starting to work on in the previous video. Turned out my wife actually didn't have an issue with it. I just felt incredibly unproductive with it. So I gave up on that pretty quick. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.